Millions of Catholics around the world travel constantly or have non-traditional jobs that keep them on the go and prevent them from receiving the sacraments regularly and being part of a normal parish community. Tonight, we'll talk with the priest who ministers to these people, so please stay with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa. Our guest tonight has several unique mission fields during his ministry to people on the move, from airline passengers and employees at Chicago's busy O'Hare Airport to those a bit less stressed sailing the seas on cruise ships and other maritime vessels. Even in his current placement as pastor of the newest parish in the Archdiocese of Chicago, which is St. Raphael the Archangel in Old Mill Creek, the parishioners and even the church building itself was on the move. So we'll have him explain that a little bit later in the second half of the show. So please welcome Father John Jemnicki. Father John, nice welcome. To Good nice to have to you, you here Mitch. with us. Pleasure. So, welcome to Alabama. I you know I've known you for a number of years. For a number of years now. Because uh, I've traveled the airport in uh, Chicago. And of course, when I lived there, I was a regular passenger. Right. Um, it's a big hub for United, so usually them, but also the other airlines. And a uh, number of times I celebrated Mass there Correct. because there's uh, a chapel with the Blessed Sacrament reserved, but it's also a chapel for all faiths. That's correct. Did you start that chapel or how did that get going? I did not. The, the chapel at O'Hare, and it was very similar with many other airport chapels like Midway around, around, this, around this country and around the world, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest with you. The very first uh, airport chapel in the, in the world was started in, uh, in Boston in about uh, 1955 uh, or the early mm -hmm. 50s. Cardinal Cushing actually began it. He had a good number of priests uh, after uh, World War II that were available for special ministries, more than he needed for the parishes. And he saw the need as, uh, as uh, commercial aviation began uh, that it might be uh, very good to have a, a priest at the airport. So in Boston's airport, it was the first airport chapel ever established in, in the world, mm -hmm. in fact, and from then many other ones. Uh, Chicago's uh, ministry began in about 1960 at uh, Chicago O'Hare. Uh, and uh, the way it really began was that the, uh, uh, the employees, the employees that worked all of these odd ships and the shifts and there were people that were moving uh, constantly from one airport to another. They didn't have regular residences because they would be transferred to work at this airport or that airport, sure. depending on uh, what they were doing. Uh, they needed, they felt the need for the sacraments. And they petitioned uh, the Archbishop of Chicago in a big way. It put a lot of political pressure on them. Uh, to get a priest out there and to have mass at the airport. As a matter of uh, fact, in Chicago, isn't about all pressure political except for water pressure? Well, uh, wherever there are two or three gathered, there is politics, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, right, so, right. Uh, so there is some politics involved, yeah, yeah. yes, in Chicago. Uh, it's, it's a major uh, sport. Very, very interestingly, uh, when I first arrived there in 1982 uh, at O'Hare, we had eight scheduled masses on the weekend mm -hmm. in the chapel. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were two. Uh, there was a, a, a Saturday evening mass at 6:15, a midnight mass, then um, then four masses uh, during the day. I'm, I'm going to get my numbers right. Let's see. Yes, four masses during the day, five masses during the day, and then a late afternoon mass on Sundays. Mm -hmm. So there were eight, eight masses scheduled. It was a it was a mind-boggling schedule, but the midnight mass still came from the pre-Vatican II times of, uh, of when the, uh, uh, the chapel was first established, 
because employees could only, workers could only attend sun, Sunday Mass after midnight. There were no Saturday evening Masses. Right. And so it came out of that tradition so that they could sure. fulfill their, uh, their Sunday obligations. Plus, so if they wanted to, you, you couldn't eat. Fasting purposes, right. yes. If, uh, so and so it was, it was a, a, shortly after I was there, we were able to move away from the, the midnight Mass and we changed the schedule a little bit. Right. But uh, to this day, there are still six Masses celebrated every weekend, two on Saturday evening, four on Sunday and uh, at O'Hare. And, um, and there is daily Mass every day at, at the O'Hare Chapel. And any number of times, priests who are traveling through O'Hare or Midway can contact the chaplains and oftentimes celebrate Mass as well. Always available. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that the other day, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, uh, you recall everyone does, I'm sure, that Father Hesburgh has just passed uh, some, yes. some weeks ago. Yeah. Father Hesburgh was a regular at the O'Hare Chapel. We, they, left, they left a side uh, table completely set up with vestments for him because he would, every time he would travel through there, coming or going back to Notre Dame, he would go into the chapel and celebrate sure. Mass. So it was always like that. Many bishops would stop by. Mm -hmm. a, a traveling, traveling clergy would always be there to celebrate Mass. So it was always available like that. And you know, something else, um, I don't uh, usually celebrate Mass there. Haven't done that in a long time. Yeah. But in other in past times, I've had no option except to take that time off, celebrate Mass, and then get a, catch another Correct. flight. Correct. Um, but... What I also notice, you know, because I do love to go there if I have a long wait sure. uh, for, for an airplane, to go pray my office, make a holy hour. Sometimes you have enough time for a complete holy hour. And I see a lot of other people doing the same. Many people come in and pray through the whole time. Absolutely. And that's, that's also a very important part of that ministry. It's also uh, an interfaith chapel, as you mentioned yes. originally. And when I'm talking about O'Hare, I'm talking about a lot of airport chapels now. Uh, so, I mean, right. which I will tell you a little bit more about as we go along in this conversation. Uh, but I have actually seen numerous occasions where you will go into that chapel to pray and there will be a Catholic on the kneeler before the Blessed Sacrament, uh, before the tabernacle in prayer. Over to one side, uh, there will be a a Muslim right. uh, on, on a prayer rug in prayer. And then in the back of the chapel, a, a Jew with full prayer regalia wrapped around in prayer. Where else in the world would you find uh, the people of the three major monotheistic faiths mm -hmm. praying at the same time in the same place? Right. Right. Only and in getting air, along. And getting along. That's right. a, a really don't remarkable. Don't forget the getting along what part. A, what, a, what a wonderful thing. In Chicago, kind of, that's another thing we don't that, take for right. granted you've is when it. people get it. along. That's right. <laughs> and, and I mean, this is happening not only at, at, at Chicago here, but all over the world. That's right. All over Europe, uh, there are airport chapels. Uh, and other New parts York. of the world, New York, I mean, yeah. all over the country, there are airport chapels. There are many of them. I, I don't want to go through the whole list. Uh, that's either available through the, uh, the Bishops' Conference or our, our National Catholic Conference of Airport Chaplains here in the United States who, have, uh, who are on the web and the like. They can, you know, you can look that up there with their mass schedules and, and like, so they're really available. But there are all kinds of other ministries to people on the, on the move well, in, in this just, country. Just something yeah. I want to make mention yeah. of, too is um, just as it was, uh, it was the lay people, the, primarily the workers, who put some pressure to have this, um, it's good also if you're uh, in some cities where there are chapels, but they may not have the Blessed Sacrament reserved necessarily. Some do not. Mm -hmm. Many do, many do not. It, you, can, you can influence them to say, we would like that. And you've got a very tasteful tabernacle that still would not have such decoration on it that the Muslims or the That's Jews correct. who come in there to pray would say, oh, I got to leave. No, it's still That's welcoming. Correct. And, you know, you might be able to think about that with some of the chapels at all the airports. Secondly, to also, because I've run into this, I had this happen in uh, Atlanta. They uh, let people have services. Mm -hmm. 
but they had no Catholic prayer books, no mass books, no wine. Um, they, they didn't belong to a denomination that drank wine. Right, right, and right. they wouldn't have Eucharistic bread. And sometimes local lay folk might be able to you know, ask them very nicely, the nice people, and ask them, could you make it also right. available for more specifically Catholic services Correct. as well? Correct. Uh, even Atlanta has several Catholic deacons that are, yes. are, are a active in that ministry in Atlanta. And that was one of what my one of my jobs were uh, for six years. I was on staff of the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops from 2000 to 2006. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose of my position then as National Coordinator for Human Mobility Apostolates were to help further development of these ministries, uh, see them grow, uh, have networking among them, uh, and, uh, and establishing new ministries like this to, to people on the move. Because uh, the, real, the real issue is uh, so many of these people uh, just cannot take advantage of the local parish. Right. They can't it, it, leave because, the because, and I'm not. Ta I'm talking about in all these aspects, whether they're traveling on vacation, whether they're on tours, uh, whether they're out to sea, uh, whether they're working in any of these areas. The local parish is really not available to them. So what what the church has done for for almost forever, it has responded by bringing the sacraments, bringing the church to where the people are, sure. rather than the people always having to go where a church is. Right. You go to where the people are, and that's kind of always been the, the basis right. of this ministry. Right. I, I've seen any number of photographs of military chaplains setting up on the hood of a jeep, because they were kind of flat. Oh, right. of course. And, you know, so we go to where folks are. A priest has to be where the people are. Yep. Now, another way, you're starting to say there's other ways in which this people uh, in mobility, people on the move kind of ministry takes place. Ships are one of them, are they not? Yes. Sailing uh, ships, not uh, airships. That's correct. That's correct. I, I uh, During my six years in, uh, in, in Washington, uh, we received, we're receiving many, uh, many complaints, I would say, from uh, uh, from passengers on cruise ships because the cruise ships could not find priests many times to, uh, to be on board uh, to celebrate masses on Sundays and on holy days and at, at high holy days of the, of the church and of other religions, Christmas, Easter and the like. And uh, so they were just looking everywhere and they were getting many imposters, people that were not in fact validly ordained Catholic priests in union with Rome presenting themselves as priests. And so uh -huh. the stories galore, you know, I had heard, you know, uh, consecrating bagels, introducing their wives at the end of a, uh, of a mass, uh, all kinds of horrendous things. And so the, the bishops then uh, gave me uh, liberty to go ahead and try to get something <laughs> developed where we could uh, provide a Catholic priests for these cruise ship companies who wanted to have Catholic priests on board. You know, here's so, the other question I have. Yeah. Who eats bagels on a ship? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, know. you, you got to get them from New York or Chicago. I mean, bagels on a ship, they're going to be soggy. But anyway, they, I They would have them. They probably baked them themselves. They have their own bakeries, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, so the, uh, the story is uh, we developed a whole program over those years, uh, which we call the Sh Cruise Ship Priest Program, under the auspices <coughs> of the Apostleship of the Sea, which is an old ministry of the, of the Catholic Church. It has mm -hmm. an office at the Holy See. And uh, its primary uh, and that, ministry that's is S E E. Uh, yes, S E A. Apostleship of the Sea. At the Holy Sea. At C. the Holy Sea. So you got e -E. two C's we in there. You got two C's. That is correct. Just, that's right. Yes, right. that are clear. correct. And uh, and and the the story is uh, uh, these uh, uh, these the Apostleship of the Sea has always been about maritime ministry. Uh, to sailors, to people uh, uh, on board uh, cargo ships. Uh, what we don't realize, the ones who work on cruise ships, the, one who, the ones who work on, on freighters and the like, many times are away from home 10, 12 months a year for a leak, a year, sometimes a year and a half. They're, they're away from their parish, away from their family. Uh, they do not have the sacraments available to them. Uh, they, the very limited port calls. It's very, very difficult. And so that's why the Apostleship of the Sea was established, so that priests could go on board and when the ships come into port, celebrate Mass with the seafarers and the like. That same Apostleship of the Sea here in the United States uh, is the one that is now overseeing the cruise ship uh, priest program and seeing that only legitimate priests are on board these cruise lines. Now there's about five cruise lines that we have 
contracts and relationships with that, that we provide uh, Catholic priests for, a uh, couple of them, we have a priest on every one of their cruises, a priest on every one, a valid priest on every, that's approved by their bishop, that's everything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, that's on, and other ones, we have them on some of the high holy days. But then there's other cruise ship uh, lines that, that we are not sure whether they have valid priests right. on or not. Right. I always encourage people to go on the cruises with the lines that you know you have a, a vetted Catholic priest on board that has the approval to be there and celebrate Mass. Yeah, and, and even if somebody is validly ordained but does not have the permission of his bishop. That is correct. That's another kind of problem because he might be floating around that the is ocean correct. And that's why because we're, we're very, he's very floating very, around the moral. And, and that had yes. happened in the past too. Yes. And that is not happening anymore to any of the priests that are, are vetted through the Apostleship of the Sea uh, USA. And so it's been a very, very positive program, and the Catholics have really appreciated that very much. Right. Right. And I mean, besides all of that to people on the move, we have chapels in national parks around this country. We have mass being celebrated in, in hotels and, uh, and places of, you know, where the conventions are being t taken place and the like. We have chaplains that work with the circus workers and carnival workers around the country and also that travel with them in sports teams, sports teams and, and, and races, you know, the uh, auto races uh, and the like. We have chaplains that are with them, priests that celebrate mass with these. One of my greatest disappointments uh, when I left the Bishop's Conference uh, with the people on the Moves Ministries, I wanted to develop, and at that time there were some difficulties in finances at the conference itself. I wanted to develop a, a whole ministry to Catholic motorcycle riders, a, a whole club for motorcycle riders. I like it. So I, I, I really did, and several bishops uh, ride. Several bishops ride. They could have been, they could have been moder Episcopal liaisons and all that to this ministry. I wanted to try to get it organized, a whole network of, uh, 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 of uh, this throughout the country because at these major rallies or so, there should be priests, chaplains to the people like, to celebrate Mass, to provide the sacraments. That's what it's all about. People on the move, that the sacraments are available to them where they are when they gather as a group. And the church needs to do that, and that's why these ministries are so vital and so important. And so many times people don't even realize that they are taking place, and in some areas where they should be taking place, they're not because... Either there's not enough clergy or, or the bishops have not embraced uh, uh, taking on this responsibility. So. My, my baby brother, okay. who's no longer a baby, he's in his 50s. Sure. However, yeah. however uh, he customizes Harleys for a living. Uh -huh. uh, he's got a place in Michigan called Twisted Twin. All right. And he and his biker friends are constantly doing various rallies. They have a blessing of the bikes. Sure. Oh, they yeah. go to one church Absolutely. and they get the bikes blessed. They do a lot of work uh, helping out kids at Christmas. Sure. Veterans, wounded veterans, all and and it, it's not, you know, a lot, some people think it's just um, uh, older guys who can afford those bikes and are looking for trouble. It's not. These are good folks. You know, the troublemakers to be sure, but he's a good folks and ministering in those areas is a good thing. Very good. And, and, uh, and along with that, you know, along the highways and the roads, we've tried, there are a few of them around the country, very few, they need to be developed, are truck stop chaplaincies. You, we need to have uh, ministries and the Catholic Church presence at these major truck stops and stuff. You are talking about thousands of trucks parked at these places. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people, you know, constantly coming through these kinds of places uh, to have a ministry there. Uh, and we have some, that was one of the reasons that I will talk about a little bit more later, even my own home parish now that I'm the pastor of and that, uh, that we're building. So the, there is a truck stop in it, Russell Road Truck Stop, a big one, a big TA truck stop. And I have been trying to work on developing a whole ministry there because I come out of this background uh, of realizing that we have a responsibility. Our parish has a responsibility to those that are passing through our parish and stopping at that truck stop, and, they should, and we should be reach out to them. No, as a matter of fact, it's something else that would be a part of such a ministry. Uh, I remember when I was stationed in Texas that there was, uh, we, we, our parish has Eucharistic adoration, 
And truckers who were aware of that, you know, that, that we made that known, and truckers would stop. They, they, it was close enough to the interstate. They could get off, make a visit, and a little short hold, a time of prayer and stuff, and then get back on the road again. And that was uh, uh, another part of the church ministry, making that known so that truckers can come to know mass schedules and prayer times. Really, I mean, Catholic churches along the, the major highways and the like here. I was actually admiring coming over here today from, from down near Coleman uh, on the, that Mother Angelica has a large poster along I-65 here in Alabama, yes, yes. advertising the shrine, welcoming. Uh, this is what we need to do even for people that are traveling on the highways and byways. We need to say, Sunday Mass is at this time. This is it. Everyone is welcome. Invite the truckers. Invite the travelers. People on the move need the sacraments, and it's the responsibility of the local church somehow to provide it for their, for their visitors, for those that are passing through. We need to be make it available to them. I always say, if the gentlemen's clubs are going to be advertising, we need to make sure they know that after they're done there, they need to come to confession. You are correct. That is correct. And that they, you know, and they might even get some advice not to go back. Uh, so making our signs as prominent as the signs for the sinners is a good idea. Vital, vital. We need to get that out. And that's why, that's why I was so pleased to even be on this, your show with you tonight here. Because Catholics need to know that not only should they take advantage of what the church is offering in you know, all of these areas around the world, that they, that, but they also need to know that the church is offering the sacraments and they are offering a place <coughs> where their family welcomes them when they are traveling. Uh, uh, hospitality, warmth, and the graces of the sacrament are, are available to them as they are on the move. Another thing, too, I'd like to, for folks, for our viewers to draw from this is, wait a minute, you know, Father Jim, Nikki does this, but what am I doing in my parish? You don't have to be the priest. You can be the deacons or the lay leaders, Correct. as well as the priest. You know, the, you know, a, lot of, a lot of priests are just really working hard. They don't have a lot of free time. Correct, correct. So, you know, why don't some of the parishioners you know, think about ways they can make known to passers-by before you get to our exit on the interstate, uh, we put some signs. Correct. Come to Mass. Here's right. our, and put the schedule Catholic on Church. a billboard. Right. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, you know the uh, the, uh, 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 the 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 real the real issue. So many times is uh, 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 what is it going to say about uh, about the, the laity and, and 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 the priests or the like and oh. The commands of Christ about what we're supposed to do, people are, are so aware of uh, feed the hungry, mm -hmm. you know, uh, give, give uh, those who are thirsty something to drink, clothe the naked and the like. There's one there that, that we don't take advantage of as much that, that Christ said we must do, and that is welcome the stranger. Yep. We are to welcome the stranger. And so I think it is a command of Christ in order for us to enter eternal life, really, that we have done that too in our life. That those that are tra traveling, those that are on the move, those are, that are displaced, those that are not in their homes, that we have to welcome them, right. the stranger, into, into our, our homes, into our lives, and we have to share the gifts and blessings of God with, with others that come, come in contact with. It's vital, just vital. We have to welcome the stranger. Most hotels I've ever gone to can give you the address and even the mass schedule. Generally, that's correct. But we as Catholics shouldn't depend just on people asking maybe, but be more proactive in getting out there to, like I say, welcome the strangers. That's right there in my Bible. That's it's chapter 25 of St. Matthew's Gospel. That's right. mm -hmm. Chapter verse 39 on down. That's correct. And so make sure that, you know, say this is another way to do that, and I and the parishioners can be part of it. That is correct. That is correct. Well, that's a good thing. I want, just let me give people a little bit uh, before we go to a break uh, for some more information on the Bishop's Conference, the USCCB's Human Mobility Apostolates. You can go to usccb.org. That's us. 
ccb.org. That stands for U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops.org. And search for, when you get there, People on the Move. Okay, so uh, that's a great way to find out more about this and maybe get some more ideas for your parish to be much more clever than the sinners in getting people in. Well, we're going to be on the move. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes because Father Jim Nicky also has another very interesting movement issue going on. So please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Appreciate it. First of all, I want to invite all of you to come and join us if you can. I love having you in our studio audience. Just love it. And you can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to our website EWTN.com and they will give you information about the scheduling of the masses, the programs, Ways to get up to Hansfold uh, to go to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament that we were talking about before, as well as places to stay and places to eat. No, forget we've got those wonderful Irondale establishments with a religious theme. Hamburger Heaven. Wow. Golden Rule Barbecue. Mm -hmm. So, it, we, and, and of course, there's the Irondale Cafe. So come on down and join us. We'd love to have you with us. Let's start off with a question. Okay, before, because I know we got to get to another topic with you, but let me want to get one question uh, from the studio audience because it was a great one. Ma'am, where are you from? New Orleans, Louisiana. It's you some. And so, what is your question? I was just wondering what cruise lines have the priest on board now? The biggest group of priests on board any cruise line, and that means every cruise that they have, is Holland American. Holland American. Every cruise of Colin Americans has a priest that's on board and says daily mass and says mass on weekends, you know, Sunday masses on Saturday and on Sunday. And also each week has a mass at about midnight for the crew. The Catholic crew all come to mass because they don't have opportunities to go. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. The other cruise lines that have mass, but not for every cruise, is Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean has, uh, especially at, on the Holy Days and other, other cruises, but I can't promise on every cruise, you'd have to almost contact the Apostleship of the Sea USA to find that out. And, uh, and they also say Masses for the cruise whenever they're on board. Whenever our cruise ship priests are on board a cruise ship, they say Mass not only for the passengers, but also for the crew. So Royal Caribbean, there are some Norwegian, Norwegian cruise lines, uh, ships that have uh, uh, have mass on board uh, on a regular basis, and uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, lastly, um, uh, M MSC is doing it sometimes too. This uh, European cruise line, when they're sailing in American waters, they are having our, our Catholic priests on board. And often enough, uh, it's a good idea for a priest who might be interested in that kind of ministry to contact the USCCB. To, to get the approval and all that so that he can be one of those priests. The, the group that is really doing the vetting right now and you know, getting the letters from the bishops is the Apostleship of the Sea of the United States of America, okay. KOS USA. And uh, our, their home offices for that is in, uh, in uh, Port Arthur, Texas. Oh, okay. And so 
that's where Important. that's where they, they're 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 based at. Uh, they are a fully improved uh, and part of the uh, AOS organization that's connected with the Holy See and Rome and the like. Sure. So, sure. so they're the ones doing the vetting. And right now we have approximately uh, 500 priests that are appro approved cruise ship priests that are available to be on these these cruises. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not quite as stressful as running a parish. You know, uh, that you don't have to worry about running a school and paying that. You know, the, the fuel bills and the heating bills that are paid correct. for. And so, uh, you know, some men who might be moving out of the active pastoral correct. ministry in a parish might also want to move, keep up. That's correct. Great work. That's but, correct. But, you know, a little more relaxed and you don't have to pay the bills. Correct. <laughs> and you got a roof over your head. It's, 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 and, and the food is good. Yes. All right, and the food is good. Yes, yeah. terrific. <laughs> Just for those who want to make sure they have good food. Now, the other thing about you being on the move that I, I really want to get to, because it's a great story, is you and your parish. Tell us about your church and parish being on the move. Well, in, 19, in 2006, uh, I got a call in February from Cardinal George mm -hmm. saying, I want you to come back home from the, uh, from the bishop's conference, mm -hmm. and I want you to sta start a new parish in the Archdiocese <laughs> of Chicago. First time that was done in 15 years. We had not started a new parish. I said, where, Your Eminence? He said, up near Antioch, Illinois, which is right along the Wisconsin border in the northern extreme of the Archdiocese of Chicago. So I, uh, I returned then from the Bishop's Conference in July. I went up there to kind of prepare to find out what was all involved in starting the new parish. And the new parish was canonically established in uh, May 1st of, uh, of 2007. And we, we, we opened a temporary church with Sunday Mass and the like in September 1st of 2007. Now, where, did, where did you have mass? We had mass. We, what we did was we rented a farm. We did something a little different than, than people usually have done that have ever started new parishes. Rented a farm, and therefore we had a farmhouse, and we had barns. And we, we turned the barns over, one into a, a church, and the other barn into a church hall. And the, uh, and the farmhouse became the church office and my residence, the rectory. All right? And then we had... I had four months from uh, May 1st until September 1st to renovate the barn to make it an operative church. And what I did during that period of time, I used artifacts of closed churches throughout the Archdiocese of Chicago. We had closed over 100 churches uh, since 1990. And so there were a good number of artifacts available and still churches were being closed. And so when people walked into... Uh, uh, into the church on September 1st of 2007, they couldn't believe it. It looked like they were in a, 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 Catholic, a fully furnished Catholic church with beautiful artifacts uh, out of our traditions and heritage. And it appeared to be a, just a, a beautiful, small country church in a barn. On the outside, it didn't look like much. Once you got inside, you knew you were in a Catholic church with beautiful tabernacles, pews, crucifixes, and the like. When Cardinal George came out uh, uh, to bless that facility, he said at that time, you know, he was so curious where we got everything that, uh, that he had seen there. Well, that's another thing, though, in Chicago. People yeah. who are at the top shouldn't ask too many questions. Well, he asked a lot of questions, and, mm -hmm. I, and I was uh, pulling his leg a little bit on some of the things, you know. And uh, I said, do I have to tell you where I got all this stuff? Because he must have thought I stole it from somewhere. I yeah. don't know. But... Uh, but uh, so you that's would ask. That's why me, you don't ask. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But he did make his final remarks at the end of the blessing. He said, "This is by far the most beautiful temporary church I have ever seen." You know, and he made a kind of a little joke uh, at the at the end of the uh, that that day. He said, "You know, John. He said I ought to give you a St. John of God Church." Now, St. John of God was built in 1918 on the south side of Chicago. Uh, by Polish immigrants. Uh, it had uh, been a very prosperous, vibrant parish. It was one of the most beautiful churches ever built in the Archdiocese of Chicago mm -hmm. by a renowned architect by the name of Henry J. Schlacks, who built 13 of the most beautiful churches in Chicago and 
the, he founded the School of Architecture at Notre Dame University. Right? Oh, which is a very yes. good school for Very good school. He, he's the founder of that, that <laughs> architect. And, uh, and uh, I, he was joking when he told me that I should give you this church because it had been abandoned for th almost 30 years. Because of demographic changes in the community, it just was not functioning any right, longer, that, and they had left it, uh, left it abandoned. That, that, that's one of the things that's good for people to understand. Yeah. One of the reasons that so many churches in Chicago get closed is that the original immigrant communities Correct. that built them prospered yeah. and moved to the suburbs that is where correct. the churches are packed. That is correct. But in the inner city, uh, the new residents, correct. oftentimes African-American, who are not Catholic. Correct. And so nobody goes. And the Catholics who were there didn't evangelize. That is correct. That is correct. So, so uh, I told the Cardinal at that particular time when he mentioned it, because I said, this is a great line. I may be able to use it later on with him, since he was just joking, though. But I said, Your Eminence, right now we're just moving into this temporary church. I'll have to get back to you on this idea that you're presenting about the St. John of God. But we had already been thinking about, since we had used all of these beautiful artifacts from churches that were closed, maybe there would be some possibility of using this church that was closed. So a year and a half later, I came back to the, uh, the Cardinal, and I made an appointment with him and said, a year and a half ago, you had made a a suggestion that I think has some true merit to it, Your Eminence. I said that maybe, maybe it's worth following up on and investigating further, and I would like your permission to do that. And that was to go and take a look at St. John of God and see if it is feasible, both uh, 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 engineering-wise, construction-wise, and financially, to take down this beautiful church and move it up 60 miles to the northern extreme of the archdiocese and rebuild it. He said, did I say that? And I said, yes, you did, Your Eminence, the idea. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he said, okay, you have my permission to bring uh, experts in and take a look at it. So we did. We got the results. We went back to the Cardinal. Uh, the results of the, uh, of the experts were that it was not feasible to take the whole church down and move it. But they thought it was very feasible to take the whole front of the church down. Now, it was a magnificent uh, Romanesque, uh, Romanesque uh, uh, Renaissance Romanesque architectural church with the steeples, two steeples standing 140 feet high. Right. Magnificent edifice. Uh, and they felt that taking the steeples down, the whole, the whole facade, the whole front of it, and moving it was, was very feasible, very practical, and not that expensive. For $2 million, this could be done. Went back to the cardinal. And by the way, just to add to that, there's no way you could have built that today for anywhere close oh, to that. absolutely. It would have been sky high beyond All of the that. stone is carved. It's magnificent stuff. Yeah, it's All right. Went back to the cardinal, mentioned that to him, and asked him if we would have his permission to proceed on this matter for the new church for St. Raphael the Archangel. And just even that, I forgot to mention that with the name. One of the reasons, I don't know if you realize it, uh, I didn't know this, but the Cardinal basically gave me permission to name the new parish. And uh, because it is the, <laughs> it's the priority of the, uh, of, of the, of the Archbishop uh, to come up with a name for a parish. He's the one that decides that a new parish is going to be founded, so he decides what name it will, will get. Uh, when he mentioned to me some three months after I went there, he said, well, uh, uh, which I didn't know. I was waiting for him to, you know, to uh, uh, tell me what to name the new parish. He said, have you thought of a name for the parish, John? And I said, uh, well, Your Eminence, uh, I had thought of a few things, but, you know, I said, you know, I, I'll, I'll come back with something later. So I thought of, he, he said, well, I don't want any more parishes named after the Blessed Virgin. We have so many, you know, in the archdiocese. And he said, I don't want any duplication. Now, that was a pretty uh, uh, strong statement because we have almost 400 parishes in the archdiocese of Chicago, and he wanted no duplication in name. So uh, I had to look for a name that, uh, that we did not have as a, a parish for the archdiocese. And after being in uh, human mobility apostolates for almost 25 years, both at O'Hare Airport and at the Bishop's Conference, St. Raphael the Archangel came to my mind as, as, as a name that would be most fitting for the new parish. Because there already were two St. Michaels, that's, uh, Saint Raphael, south side and north side. St. Raphael is the patron of travelers. 
And so people I on the move, that was he going. Is tra- he's, a, he's the patron. And this town of Antioch, which we look, looked like we were going to be in, was originally a little tourist town where people would come uh, for weekends and vacations because of the lakes and things there. <laughs> and so it, it, a lot of tourists would come. Now it's a commuter town where everyone goes for jobs into the city and the like on public transportation and the like. And just coincidentally, there is a truck stop in the parish right along the interstate, which is in the parish. And I said it would be most appropriate that, uh, that we name it under the patronage of, since there was no other parish in the archdiocese, Raphael the Archangel. I brought it to the, to the cardinal. He said, fantastic. So go ahead with it. That's a fine name. You know, so, so we did. So that was one of the reasons. Because of People on the Move Ministries, it was named that. So we got permission from him to move the facade of St. Saint, uh, Saint John of God up north for the new St. Raphael the Archangel. We had nothing for the interior. The interior had all been destroyed because it had been left vacant for almost 30 years. At St. John, yeah, John of God. Right. Had nothing so for couldn't the use that. Yeah, yeah, couldn't use that. So I said, what are we going to do about the interior? Just coincidentally, I had heard of another church that was closed just six years previous that they were kind of preserving because they were hoping some community might, religious community might take it over or something like that. Never happened. It wasn't going to happen. I approached the cardinal about the interior of St. Peter Canisius, which was a parish on the north side of Chicago. Uh, I, I went in there, checked it out. It was exactly the same size interiorly as St. John of God was. Architecturally, the same style, a vaulted ceiling, an interior vaulted ceiling, just like St. John of God. But it had more beautiful artifacts in it than the original St. John of God did. Everything was marble, marble altar, marble reredos, side altars marble, statues marble, everything marble. Uh, John of God didn't have marble. They had, they had painted plaster, so it, it, was, it was gorgeous. The stained glass windows in, in, in St. Peter Canisius were magnificent. Tyrolean stained glass from Austria yeah. you know, from the 30s. They, it was uh, mu- museum quality stained glass worth over $2 million, all right? And then the pews. So we were able to get permission to take the whole interior of St. Peter Canisius, move it out to St. Raphael's, and then install it at St. Raphael's uh, there at the... Uh, and so the interior is from St. Peter Canisius. The exterior is from uh, St. John of God. And then we got the great organ that was in the Medina Temple, put in there in, in Chicago in 1915, the Austin Opus 558, one of the greatest organs ever built, 100 ranks, uh, 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 largest pipes, 42 feet high, two great councils, a five-manual council and a four-manual council. That uh, went to this. I knew some people in the mayor's office at the city of Chicago. The mayor was. Uh, the We're city talking had, to Chicago the, again. The, 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 is... the, the, uh, <laughs> the city of Chicago had taken possession of it when they tore the Medina Temple down to preserve this instrument, to find it a good home. We approached them. We told them that this would remain in the Chicagoland area. In the Archdiocese of Chicago, it would be used. Then they allowed us to have this organ to put into this, this church. Uh, these are such magnificent traditional artifacts. This, this project is green, it's a preservationist, and it's a beauty like you would never see before. It's costing us $15 million, the total project. But if you were to build it today, with starting from scratch, on as magnificent as it is, it would be $150 million. Yeah. And I would hope that this would ev- could even be a prototype for many of our, our urban dioceses and other dioceses in the world that something like this can be done and we can preserve the tradition, the patrimony of the church uh, in a way like, uh, like, like this possible for us now where we're putting up these, uh, these big box store churches now and uh, <laughs> some type of auditorium. They look like civic buildings. You know, this at is best. Of, at best. Because and, some of them look like supermarkets. And, 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 when I, when I first founded the parish, if, if they said it once, they said it to me a thousand times when they, people knew I was gonna be, we were going to be building a new church. They said to me, Father, please build a church that looks like a church. I'm responding to the, you know, the desires of the people. Yeah. The biggest problem we're having right now is, 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 is money. We have put $10 million into it. I don't have the steeples up yet. I don't have all of the stained glass windows in. I mean, I have all of these things. Don't have the organ in for sure. You know, that has to be refurbished and installed. And the interesting thing even about the organ, 
Here we had this magnificent instrument, so we built the church to accept the instrument. Most of the times they build a building and then they go buy an instrument, got to squeeze it in. I mean, the, it weighs almost 40 tons, the, the organ itself. We had a specially reinforced, the, we had a specially reinforced the choir loft. We had to have, you know, so now it'll fit right in. It's, it's made to, 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 to belong into this church. And this, this organ will be performed by organists from all over the world. It's, it's, it's a renowned instrument. You know, this five manual, uh, so, sure. so it's just, uh, it, it's like a project that has never been done before, but should be repeated over and over again, I would think for the future, because, Ooh. and the two parishes, St. John of God Parish and St. Peter Canisius Parish are so enthusiastic and so excited that right. their two churches are coming back to life. I have had, uh, I have, we've had reunions for this group, they have helped raise money uh, for, the, uh, for the new St. Raphael the Archangel. We're going to put a statue. There were two niches on the front of St. John of God that never had statues on them. I'm going to put a statue of St. John of God in one niche, a statue of St. Peter Canisius on the other, up high, you know, on the church in these two niches, because the new St. Raphael the Archangel is the, the wedding, the marriage of John of God and Peter Canisius into the new St. Raphael's. We're built on the old. See, one of the things that... Uh upset so many people when they hear about a church closing or a demolition is that the church is where they prayed themselves a lot, they were baptized, married, so many relatives were buried. I, the, the attachment and the memories associated with these older churches are very strong. And one of the other great things about them, as you've described, beautiful artwork everywhere so that when the priest was boring in his homily, you could at least look Correct. at the windows, the statues, and the other stuff that's in there and have something to be distracted by. So there are great memories in all these Absol places. Absolutely. And Absolutely. so, it, but it's not just nostalgia, it's, it's something deeper. And preserving it does make people rejoice that what our heritage is not being lost. That is correct. But it's being moved to where the people are. As you were saying before about the ministry to people on the move, you go to where the folks are. They've moved to the suburbs, let's go. But let's bring beauty with us. Because uh, like I said, I, I'll never forget walking out of one church, not in this country, but it really reminded me of a supermarket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just ugly. And in a lot of churches, I think you can sort of hear them revving up the engines of the bulldozers to get them out of the way to build something beautiful again. Well, I think many times they're just trying to do something cheap and practical, you know, I mean, is what it comes down to. And, and, and we were committed to, 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 uh, to, to build something that is part of our tradition that will be there for the next 100 to 200 years. I don't know if people, uh, and I think sometimes this is what I've faced, I don't think they have a vision. I'm even the leadership of our church. They don't seem to have vision and they don't seem to have faith. Uh, with this vision, I, I, I really had the faith. I mean, that's why Mother, Mother Angelica has been a great model to me. Uh, and that's why I'm even down here now with a pilgrimage. There's, I, I think with, with that faith and with that vision, you can make things happen that, that may never have been able to happen before. I have run into all kinds of opposition. There have been so many people in, in, the, uh, uh, in the administrative positions in the church in Chicago that were opposed to this concept, that the cost that might be involved, that we can't afford to do these kinds of things at this particular time, you know, in our history and the like, uh, because we're dealing with all of the struggles and things. This is the most positive thing that has happened in the Archdiocese of Chicago in the last 10 or 15 years, this new magnificent, glorious church, you know, for the people. And you've got to have positive things like that going on, that growth and that beauty and the things that, uh, that draw you to the, uh, to the Lord. And that's what, that's what this is really affording to, the, uh, uh, to so many people. And I said it's going to be there for a long time. And here's one of the things that I think is also important is You'll, I'll certainly hear from some people who say, well, God can be in any kind of place. Yes, I mean, I, I don't have to be in church. And yes, of course, it is in his union contract to be everywhere. Yes, God sir. is everywhere. Correct. There's no place apart from his presence. However, we need to have our minds and hearts elevated by beauty. 
And that's the importance of this. Father Mitch, when you walk into Saint, the new St. Raphael, the Archangel, right now, long before it's complete, it's only 60% complete, you know that you are stepping into another dimension, another world. Yes. The world of God. You really are. It's so different than any other place. Mm -hmm. I mean, the high ceilings, the magnificent ceiling that we have on yes. there, the beauty of it. It is, it is, a, it is a bit of heaven. It's where God resides, exactly. and you know it. It's not like any other place, and that's what a church has to be. Right. It has to be something like that. Why should people go to church if it's, if it's like every other place? You don't need to go to church. You need to go to church because the presence of God is there in a very special place, and the whole surrounding identifies that and lets you know that by, by entering it because of the beauty of it, because of the magnificence of it, and that's what we all aspire to. Very, very important, and that's kind of what we've tried to do with this. And using the beauty and the heritage of the church has made this, this all possible. It's, 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 been a, it's been a great and exciting project. It really has. You know, there, there was a book written some years ago. Uh, I think, I forget the name of the author right now, uh, but it was called Ugly as Sin. Mm -hmm. Did you ever read that? No, I did not. No, it's, it's about modern church architecture. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that he points out is that some of the uh, uh, successful and well-used church architects were using as a model a Japanese tea house mm -hmm. where there's emptiness. Yes. And it's to help you move to a Zen state of mind where you come to the point of, uh, of emptiness. Right. Christianity is not about Absolutely emptiness. Absolutely not. It's about a relationship. Relational. Our relationship with Jesus Christ, through Him to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in addition to Jesus and the Father and the Spirit, we have all the saints, that they are part of the family. Absolutely. And in the church like you're describing, you get a picture of what Hebrews says, where we are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. That is correct. That That's is the goal. That is, it. You, you, you hit it on the nose. That's why our churches have the statues and the stained glass and the images. It's a relational church, a relationship with God and with all of these other people that have been part of our family and our heritage, exactly. you know, through all these years. Vital, vital that we have these kinds of things there. Absolutely. And I know God has been with us all along. A big struggle, big struggle. New parish, we only got 700 families. We started with nothing seven years ago. Taking on a project like this, can you imagine? And the economy crashed in 2008. Mm -hmm. No development, uh, you know, uh, happened anymore in our area. The new church came and, and money went down. But, uh, but the, uh, the reality is we have moved ahead. We have moved ahead and, and God has been with us. I'm gonna tell you a story. Real quick. All right. We had, we had the one steeple, the one steeple that had three great bells in it, all right, and uh, from John of God. The other steeple had no bells in it. And I said, I said, we got to have three bells in each steeple. That's a shame. Why only, you know, bells in one steeple, nothing in the other one? Mm -hmm. So I kept my eyes open for, for three more bells. I'm at a presbyteral council meeting. Anytime any major changes are done in any of the churches in the archdiocese, it has to go before the presbyteral council. Which is the council for the priests. For the priests, the presbyteral mm -hmm. council for the priests. So it goes before the presbyteral council. Uh, there is a, 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 a bell tower at St. Simeon's in Bellwood, Illinois, that is structurally unsound. It has to come down. The presbyteral council votes, yes, they get permission to tear it down. I said, I wonder who the pastor is. I looked around. He happened to be at the Presbyteral Council meeting, one of the senators, a representative. I ran up to him immediately. His name was Jomo. I said, Jomo, I said, you got any bells in that steeple, uh, in that tower? Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I got three bells. I said, three bells? I said, have you got any particular uses for those three bells or anything? He said, no, no, no. I said, well, you get that off your mind. Don't you even think about those three bells anymore, Jomo. I said, St. Raphael's is going to take those three bells from you. They're going to buy, well, I'm going to buy, I'll set the price with you later. I'll contact you with it, but we're going to have those three bells. Okay, okay, fine. I now I feel like I'm back in Chicago. I, I come back, I come back to, I come back to the, uh, my, my, my office, church office. I see the business manager. I said, well, I just bought three bells. And he said, you can't do that. I said, I just did. And he said, he said, no. And he said, because bells have to be harmonious. You can't just get three bells right. and with other three bells they'll clash they right. won't 
And so, so he says, so he says to me, I, I said, that's the problem. I said, well, it'll work out. Vernon Bell people came uh, to estimate all the bells, to install them and the price and things that were involved. They wrote their estimate up and it said right on the estimate, the top line, if you were to buy six brand new bells, a more perfect combination could not be achieved. These six bells will ring the Westminster chimes. If you don't uh, think God played a well, part in that. Let me just interrupt here because as one ding dong to another, it's time to go. We're running all out right, of time. All right, all right. So may the join me in blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And do remember to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. And God willing, we'll be able to take care of all our bills too, as well as deal with the ding dongs. God bless and take care. Bye.